Every battle is both a victory and a defeat. It depends which flag you fly. In every theater of the Second World War, battles won and lost determined possession of territory, of resources, and of the strength to go on fighting. For some of the battles, it was the victory that most influenced the future course of the war. For others, it was the defeat. This is the story of the battles won and lost that decided the outcome of the greatest conflict in history. Some words transcend their origins as humble place names, even as the names given to battles won and lost. They are carved into history as turning points which influenced the course of the war, the fate of nations, the makeup of our world. These words are indestructible. El Alamein. Okinawa, Pearl Harbor. Well, Pearl Harbor was put together quite late. The Japanese had to acquire raw materials from Southeast Asia following an American embargo in July 1941. The objective was to seize quickly key points in Southeast Asia, but in order to do it, they had to bypass the Philippines. Pearl Harbor was the key. Knock out the fleet, the battleships, and they assumed carriers located at Pearl Harbor so that they would then be free at the same time to invade Malaya, to seize Southeast Asia. It was done in the understanding that in the long term, the Americans had the capacity to build up sufficient military power to create a terrible threat to Japan. But it was done in the hope that Japan could achieve sufficient success that the Americans would feel it wasn't worthwhile going on. From carriers 370 kilometers out in the Pacific, the Japanese had launched pre-dawn. The first waves fell on Pearl Harbor at 7.40 a.m. In that first attack, 40 torpedo bombers, 49 high-level bombers, 41 dive bombers, and 43 fighters swept around the west of the island of Oahu to hook up into the great naval base, the natural harbor in the south of the island. The first attack lasted for 30 minutes. We were thinking about the Army Air Force. They used to have maneuvers on Sunday mornings. We said that they're kind of early this morning. Then pretty soon we saw a bomb drop. Out of a clear sky came the treacherous Japanese attack on Hawaii. The whole world knows now how Japan assaulted the American naval base without warning, without a declaration of war, and while her envoys were actually negotiating in Washington. In addition to anchorages, the first attack had targeted air bases. Wheeler Field, Hickam Field, Kaneohe, and Ewa, grounding any possible opposition to the second raid. There were 354 American aircraft on the island, of which 188 were destroyed and 159 damaged. Seven escaped unscathed. At 8.50 a.m., the second wave hooked in from the opposite side of the island and pounded its targets for more than an hour. 
the force comprised 54 high-level bombers and 78 dive bombers with fighter support. The defenders had organized their anti-aircraft fire by this time. And we went up to our battle stations and fired at planes coming over. And it went on for a couple hours. Of the 29 Japanese aircraft lost in the raid, 20 were in the second wave. There's no question that it would have been worthwhile for the Japanese to attempt another attack and they should have been going for the oil tanks and for the dockyard facilities in order to reduce the capacity of Pearl Harbor to be the base in the Pacific from which the Americans could then mount their further attacks. They did not have enough screening vessels and had they not so much launched a third strike, had they stayed in the area, they probably would have netted the Enterprise, which was nearby. So they had the forces there, but they were very worried about uh, being so far out, lacking screening vessels, that they pulled away a bit too early. 94 warships were in the harbour. 18 were sunk or suffered serious damage. But of the five battleships that were sunk, three were to return to service. One that did not and remains today as a memorial to the date that will live in infamy was the Arizona. Four out of every five men aboard the Arizona were killed. 1,100 out of the 2,403 American fatalities on that day. A lot of the guys uh, were caught in fires and jumped over the side. Some of them drowned, some of them burned to death, some of them. But uh, I was one of the lucky ones in that case, so. As a mathematical statement, Pearl Harbor was a battle lost for the Americans. But the port's infrastructure was largely intact and there were no carriers in Pearl Harbor when the attack came in. The operation was a partial tactical success with the caveat that the wrong targets were attacked. It was a strategic failure of the worst order and Yamamoto's comment that he feared the sleeping giant had been awakened uh, I think was a correct one. The nature of that attack uh, was the thing most calculated to create in the United States a collective will to respond in a way that I don't think anything else would have. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. On the 12th of August, 1943, Hitler ordered construction of a new defensive line on the Eastern Front, the East Wall. But he forbade any thought of withdrawal to the position. So as autumn began to be felt, Axis forces stood as much as 300 kilometers ahead of the wall, which was itself well inside Russian territory. On August 26th, the Red Army began its autumn offensive. By Christmas, when winter closed down fighting, the German front had been pushed back all along its length and in the center as much as 150 kilometers behind the East Wall. The central front, Rokossovsky, moved beyond the battlefield of Kursk. 
At the same time, Army Group South, von Manstein, was coming under pressure from the third and fourth Ukrainian fronts. When Hitler visited von Manstein's headquarters on the 27th, he was called on to decide whether to reinforce Army Group South with formations from the center or permit a withdrawal behind the line of the Dnieper. He couldn't decide. When he went on to visit von Kluger at Group Center HQ, he was persuaded not to reinforce von Manstein. Fourth Ukrainian Front, Tolbukhin, liberated Taganrog two days later, and momentum was all with the advancing Russian forces. On September 2nd, Central Front reached the Bryansk Konotop Railway, completing their break-in to the German line. A week into September, and the Caucasus Front moved on the Tarman Peninsula. On the 10th, they took Mayupol by amphibious assault. And on the 14th, Central Front, with Voronezh Front, General Vatutin in support, began driving for Kiev. Towns were now being reclaimed on an almost daily basis. Bryansk on the 10th, and when Chernigov fell on the 21st, it signaled that Rokossovsky had reached the Dnieper. At the moment, the best news comes from the Russian front, where the Red Army has been scoring one triumph after another, beating back the invaders, smashing their defenses. On the 22nd, Vatutin's front began to cross the Dnieper. General Vatutin, commanding the 1st Ukrainian Army, drives on beyond the Dnieper on a wide front. Malinovsky's command crossing further south on the 26th, by which time Smolensk and Roslavi had fallen. At the beginning of October, the Baltic fronts of Yeremenko and Popov joined the offensive. By now, Manstein was back behind the East Wall, but his forces were much reduced and he would have trouble holding the position. The momentum did not relent. And at the beginning of November, the Red Army launched a major assault out of its bridgehead over the Dnieper at Lyotej. On November 6th, Kiev fell to the Red Army. And when, six days later, Zhitomir fell, two fronts were able to combine in establishing a bridgehead of 160 by 240 kilometers, completely negating the utility, indeed the very idea, of the East Wall. The scale of the Soviet comeback is without parallel in military history. With the Allies poised for attack in the west, the Red Army blasts and batters the German barbarians in the east. As campaigning stalled with winter, the German armies were still intact and they were still wholly on Russian soil. but the Soviet forces had advanced to a much stronger position from which to launch first the spring and then the epic summer offensive, Operation Bagration. When General Montgomery was appointed to command the 8th Army, he made one thing clear. He would not go onto the offensive until he had total material superiority. And he withstood Churchill's impatience until he was satisfied that the odds were right. And then he orchestrated the second battle of El Alamein. Second Alamein is very much a set piece battle. Montgomery emphasized that the troops shall be trained in the tasks that they are meant to do. So you had some battalion and brigade commanders building replicas of the positions that they're going to attack and training and rehearsing their role for weeks and weeks and weeks beforehand. General Montgomery, realizing that a citizen army fights best when it knows exactly what's going on and what it is going to do, saw to it that the plan of battle was known to everybody from general to private soldier. The battle had, in a sense, begun as another battle. The one initiated by Rommel on the night of the 30th of August on the 8th Army's position at Alam Halfa. 
targeting the weak southern end of the British line that ran about 65 kilometers from the sea to the Katara Depression. There was some desperation in Rommel's plan. Of the six supply ships on which he had been depending, four had been sunk. His success now depending, in part, on the successful capture of British fuel dumps during his advance, or his armor would be stranded. Within three days, blocked by well-prepared defensive positions, Rommel was forced back on his start line. By 2nd Alamein, the balance of materiel and troops and logistics in the Middle East had, had tipped. This is the first major battle where the British forces exceed those of the Germans in all regards, in terms of air power, in terms of men, in terms of anti-tank guns, in terms of medium tanks. Montgomery has assembled his forces and he's massed them ready for this attack to break through the line. On the night of the 23rd of October, 900 guns opened their throats. And the Battle of El Alamein was underway. The poor Germans, I said, they got it. They got it. So Montgomery, he opened up with over a thousand pieces of artillery on that other way line. They came over like hailstones. North to south from the coast to the Katara, Montgomery deployed a truly Commonwealth force. 9th Australian Division at the Coast Road, the 51st Highland Division, 2nd New Zealand and 1st South African, then 4th Indian and further south, 50th and 44th Divisions and Free French, with three armoured divisions in support. 2nd New Zealand was the first advancing force to claim its first objective. It secured Materia Ridge, but 10th Armoured in support did not exploit the chance to break out. North of them, 9th Australia was slowed passing through a minefield, with 1st Armoured hanging behind them. All this while, Rommel was away. He had gone to Germany on sick leave. On the 25th, he returned to his command. And to find that along the line from the British 13th Corps in the south, to the intended main break-in in the north, the attackers had been checked and progress slowed. The resistance along the Alamein line was very strong. The British and Commonwealth forces were not able to break through. Montgomery's battle plan was delayed and essentially it had to be reset. Rommel launched armour to recover ground lost at Materia and Kidney Ridges, but was beaten back. Montgomery concluded from the progress of the battle that the main German concentration was in the north, facing the troops that he had charged with making the breakthrough. He responded by realigning the major thrust. This would now come south of the coastal sector in a new plan, Supercharge, where its principal opposition would be the Italian formations. 9th Australian was to continue pressure on the coast road, but the main line of attack would now be inland and westwards. Supercharge and the breakthrough began in the middle of the night of the 1st of November. Second New Zealand led the attack, supported by 1st Armoured Division, which took a heavy toll of 15th Panzer, which engaged it. Success was consolidated on November 3rd, when 4th Indian and the 51st were sent in against Kidney Hill. Their breakthrough opened the road for 7th and 10th Armoured, which raced through into open country. I can't remember, there was one tank sitting out in front, burning one of ours, and a voice in my ear saying, help, help me. The operator on that tank had been on the wireless when his tank was hit, and uh, somebody was trapped in that tank, the wireless was still on. God's sake, help me. And one of our tanks put a shot through the side of it and the voice stopped. When 1st Armoured and the New Zealand Division joined the offensive, the Italian Ariete Division was almost completely destroyed. Rommel was on the back foot all along the line. South, 13th Corps under General Horrocks 
overran the Italian formations facing it. And the entire Axis line was now falling back as Rommel began his withdrawal along the coast. By escaping, even if only to be pursued all along the North African littoral, Rommel had avoided the total defeat for which Montgomery hoped. If there's a criticism to be laid at this point in time, it's of the timidity of the Allied follow-up. But we also have to remember that a lot of Montgomery's units had fought themselves to a near standstill, breaking through at Alamein. That his armoured forces were starting to feel the toll of battle. That particularly the Australian division, it had been hammered in its fight to the north. So the capacity of Montgomery's forces to chase was quite limited as well. But by any assessment, Rommel had suffered a decisive loss. And the Allies, for the first time in the war, could celebrate a decisive victory. After Alamein, the Germans essentially are on their way out of North Africa. Dealing with North Africa starts the Allies thinking about their re-entry into Western Europe. And in many ways, it's the turning point in the war for the Western forces. Germans have received back again that measure of fire and steel which they have so often meted out to others. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. When the wars of East and West were joined by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the longest battle of the Second World War was already over two years old. It was known as the Battle of the Atlantic, and it started as the war in Europe began, with the Atlantic remaining a battlefield until the very last days of the war. It was the vital logistic battle of the war. Whether it failed or succeeded on either side really determined the course of the war, and how well it was going profoundly influenced what each side could be doing in other campaigns. There were periods in the first years of the war the German U-boat commanders dubbed them the happy times, when it seemed as though the Battle of the Atlantic could decide the war and decide it in favour of the Axis powers. But the tide of battle turned in the first half of 1943, after which it was clear that the Allies had control. The basis of Britain's imperial power had always been importing raw materials from and exporting manufactured goods to her colonies and dominions. This had made the United Kingdom more than usually dependent on imports for survival. And those imports must ultimately join one of the Atlantic sea lanes. After the fall of France, German aircraft, surface ships and submarines were based along the French Atlantic coast. From the airfields and ports of the French coast, their efforts to disrupt and destroy Britain's vital maritime lifeline became the Battle of the Atlantic. Germany's glamorous surface vessels, such as the Bismarck, Graf Spee, Scharnhorst and Tirpitz, took a toll. But each was picked off in turn by the Royal Navy. Aircraft sank ships but not in numbers that would have forced the British Isles to its knees. The real threat was the submarine. The advantage the submarine has as a commerce raider, I think, was paramount. The submarines could attack unseen, were very difficult to detect. Once detected, were good at evading and could come and re-attack. The Germans also set up a pretty sophisticated system for working out where the targets were and for concentrating the U-boats to do mass attacks. Lessons learned in the First World War meant that from the outset, merchant ships traveled in convoys. Admiral Dönitz, commanding the submarine fleet, evolved a tactic to counter the convoy system. Rudel tactic, 
which came to be called the Wolf Pack. It worked. With the U-boats hunting in packs, extra vigilance by the convoys is essential to their safety. Dönitz never had as many submarines as he wanted, but then the Allies did not initially have as many escorts as they wanted. And for the first years of the war, there was a gap in the air cover where convoys sailed beyond the range of aircraft. As the battle wore on, tactics changed. New weapons were developed, which were much more effective at destroying the U-boats. It was a constant battle of offence versus defence and developing technology on both sides. Fundamentally, all these things, together with perhaps the most important, which was the provision of long-range aircraft and air support to the convoys, which created, as a totality, a system which was able to reduce the U-boat threat. The decisive month was May 1943. To the Germans, this was Black May. German submarine losses had risen sharply in proportion to the number of Allied ships being sunk. In April, 39 ships had been lost, but at a cost to the Germans of 15 U-boats, an unsupportable rate. And then convoy ONS-5, designated a slow convoy, sailed. 43 merchant ships were escorted by 16 warships. And in the Atlantic, the convoy came under attack from a pack of U-boats variously assessed at between 30 and 40 strong. Their attack went in on the night of May 4th. A Canadian Air Force Catalina sank one U-boat, an escort ship another. And 12 of the merchantmen were sent to the bottom. On the 5th, the escort group was reinforced. On the night of the 6th, the pack attacked again. And four U-boats were sunk. No merchantmen were lost. It is sometimes difficult to pinpoint the turning point at which a drawn-out battle was decided. But here was one. Convoy SC-130, a week later, met similar success. 37 merchantmen with an eight-ship escort sailed into the danger zone, where they were picked up by U-boats on May 19th. That same day, the convoy was joined on station by Escort Group 1. Three days later, the convoy entered British waters and Escort Group 1 detached. In that mid-Atlantic passage, the U-boat pack had come under constant aircraft and surface vessel attack. Four submarines were sunk, without loss to the convoy. In the first three weeks of May, 31 U-boats were sunk. The total would reach 41 by the end of the month, and Dönitz was forced to temporarily suspend operations in the North Atlantic. The losses were prodigious. 36,000 merchant seamen, the same number of Allied soldiers, not less than 30,000 German submariners, thousands of vessels, hundreds of aircraft. But no battle had a more vital bearing on the war in Europe. The Allies prevailing the Atlantic allowed the remainder of the war to be fought. So by enabling the logistics, enabling the North American industrial machine to provide all the resources that were needed to fight what was an industrial war, the Battle of the Atlantic was central. With the Soviet Union coming under immense renewed pressure in the early summer of 1942, as well over a hundred Axis divisions renewed their assault, Stalin demanded more of his allies. Stalin wanted Churchill to open up a second front, but he just wasn't in a position to do that at the time. So Churchill reasoned that a major raid could be a kind of compromise. If they could take a, a significant port, that would show the Germans that they were vulnerable in that area. Uh, that would then 
force Hitler to redistribute some of his forces down to protect that part of, of Europe, which would in turn take some of the pressure off the Red Army and in, importantly show Stalin that Churchill was doing his part, that he was a willing partner and not just sitting back while Russian lives were being taken en masse. The Allied forces came up with the idea of a cross-channel raid. A raid, by definition, means hit and run. This was not to be an attempt to gain a toehold, let alone launch an invasion. They would, it was said, gain useful intelligence about German coastal defences preparatory to launching a full-scale invasion at a later date. There were also secondary objectives, and the RAF in particular were eager to see this as an opportunity to draw out the Luftwaffe to have a, a ding-dong battle and hopefully give them a hard time. At this time, the, the new Spitfire Mark IX had just come out, and so they were confident that they'd be able to give the Luftwaffe a run for their money. Producers of British aircraft have already proved that they turn out the best planes in the world. Each new Spitfire bears witness to the great contribution of British design and workmanship. The objective selected was Dieppe. It was, in its planning, known as Operation Rutter. In its execution, it was called Operation Jubilee. British Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery's Southeastern Command provided the troops for the operation and planned a frontal assault without heavy preliminary air bombardment. Under pressure from the Canadian government to ensure that Canadian troops saw action, the Canadian 2nd Division was selected for the main force. They would assault the town while British parachute units attacked German batteries on the headlands as a diversion. That never happened. Bad weather caused delays. Montgomery was sent to North Africa to find the 8th Army and fame. The code name was changed to Jubilee and Lord Louis Mountbatten took over planning. The air bombardment on Dieppe was reduced for fear of French casualties. Destroyers were allocated to bombard the shore. It was judged that battleships were too vulnerable that close to the coast. The parachute operation on the flanks was cancelled. An intelligence on which planning was based was patchy and in some cases laughable. German gun positions dug into the sides of the headland cliffs were not spotted by air reconnaissance and planners assessed the beach gradient and its suitability for tanks by scanning holiday snapshots. The Royal Marine Commando was to land in fast gunboats after the main force had gone in. They were to destroy the Dieppe dock installations and capture documents in a safe in the port office. The break-in was to be the special responsibility of a Marine who had been a burglar in civilian life. It has recently been suggested, as documents have been declassified, that their real objective was a new Enigma machine, which was defying British cryptanalysts. The naval intelligence officer planning that part of the raid was Ian Fleming, later to find fame as the author of the James Bond novels. Now, is this true? Well, we certainly know that Ian Fleming was there at Dieppe. It was his only uh, battle experience from World War II. Uh, so that is certainly true. We certainly know that it was a goal of the Dieppe raid to gather intelligence. So that certainly fits. So it's very possible. The Germans, alerted by French double agents that the British were targeting Dieppe, were on high alert. It began with the Navy taking the army across a calm channel in a dim light just before dawn. Navy, Army and RAF combining in a bigger raid than any attempted so far. The raid began at 0450 on the 19th of August with the faint remaining hope of surprise having been lost. The landing craft of the Eastern Sector had unexpectedly encountered a small German convoy. The resultant violent sea fight alerted the German coastal defences at Berneval and Puit. As the assault force approached the coast of France, the Germans were at action stations. 
Two commando units made flanking landings, number three on Yellow Beach at the eastern end of the landing zone, and number four on Orange Beach at the western end. The main force hit three beaches at and about the town and port of Dieppe. Blue to the east, green to the west, and the main force coming in on red and white beaches. Number 4 Commando successfully stormed the Varangevia battery and was the only unit to capture all of its objectives. Only 18 men from Number 3 Commando got ashore in the right place. They managed to distract the Berneval battery to good effect, but were eventually forced to withdraw as superior enemy forces responded to their landing. A concentrated naval bombardment preceded the main landing. But fire from destroyers was too light to seriously affect the defences. A concentrated RAF attack was equally limited in effect. And a smoke screen laid across the headland had dubious value. Indeed, it was a factor contributing to sending in reserves with fatal consequences when the outcome of the original assault was misinterpreted. On the east of the main landing at Puit, just 60 men out of 543 from the Royal Regiment of Canada were taken off. The regiment had been pinned to the beach and destroyed by coastal defence batteries and a well-sighted machine gun. Only a handful of the men of the South Saskatchewan Regiment reached their objectives, with others from this regiment landing in the wrong place. The Queen's own Cameron Highlanders of Canada, despite being landed late, managed to push further inland than any other troops, but were forced back when German reinforcements rushed up. Half an hour after the flank landings, the main assault started. The Canadian Essex Scottish Regiment and Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, supported by 27 Churchill tanks of the 14th Canadian Army Tank Regiment. Most of the tanks lost their tracks as they were driven onto the Shingle Beach and became crippled targets for German anti-tank guns. Tanks that did cross the Shingle were stopped by concrete roadblocks. Without tanks in support, the infantry was simply slaughtered by crossfire from machine guns hidden in the cliffs. Les Fusiliers Mont-Royal, launched straight at the centre of the town, were pinned down under the cliffs. A Royal Marine Commando was ordered to land to support them, a new task which caused chaos. When finally the mess was sorted and the commando moved, many of the craft were hit on the run-in. Those that reached the shore were killed or captured, and their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Tigger Phillips, seeing that the mission was futile, stood up and signalled to those following to turn back. He was killed a few moments later. At 10.20, a little over five hours after the battle had begun, five hours in which everything possible went wrong, the withdrawal began. Five hours after that, the last Allied troops had either been taken off, killed, or taken prisoner. 60% of the invading force was killed, wounded, or captured. And they had lost weapons, dingo armored cars, and Churchill tanks, which did not impress the Germans. Easy to fight, they said, with a poor and obsolete gun. The Royal Air Force lost over 100 aircraft, the Luftwaffe less than 50, and the Royal Navy lost 33 landing craft and a destroyer. Casualties from the raid included 3,367 Canadians killed, wounded, or taken prisoner, and 275 British commandos. German army casualties were 591. The argument began at once and has not relented. Was the Dieppe raid of any value?
the principles of special operations are that, that it's got to be fast, it's got to be, be uh, stealthy, um, and you've got to achieve surprise. And this operation was simply too big to achieve that. It was too complex. It couldn't be a special operation in that sense. They've certainly been through it, but they were already talking about next time, even before they got into hospital. It is, of course, easy to make the case that lessons were learned and that those lessons made a significant difference to planning for the invasion of Europe on D-Day in 1944. It is rather more difficult to make the case that the lessons could not as easily have been learned by better use of intelligence, in both of the meanings of that word. War in the Pacific has moved so fast that there may be a danger of underrating the enemy. Let no one imagine that recent victories in the Pacific indicate a walkover. The Japanese continue to fight back with a fanaticism quite unknown in the West. By early 1945, Japan is plainly beaten. On any objective measure, the Japanese Empire cannot win the war. But the Japanese culture, military culture especially, will not allow the Japanese to acknowledge that. So Japan has to be battered into submission. To do that, the Allies, the Americans especially, need to build air bases. To build air bases, they need islands. And to need, if they need islands, they need Okinawa. For the invasion of Okinawa, 430 assault transports had been loaded at 11 ports from Seattle to Leyte. On April 1st, 1,300 ships were massed offshore and the first waves of the 155,000 men of General Simon Bolivar Buckner's 10th Army, three Marine and four Army divisions began going ashore. They met very little opposition, but before the island fell, American forces involved would have numbered 300,000. General Ushijima, commanding the Japanese 32nd Army, had pulled his forces back, deciding not to contest the landing, but to meet the invasion south of the Shuri Line. By the end of the first day, Buckner had 60,000 men ashore. General Ushijima's strategy to defend Okinawa is to sell it at the highest human price. So he doesn't waste lives meeting the Americans on the beaches, for example. Japanese withdraw into the interior and they basically say, come and get us. And that means the Americans have to expend lives in order to kill Japanese in order to gain victory. And the, the Japanese strategy is about the most simple and brutal you can imagine. The ships riding at anchor tell a different story. The invasion fleet was battered by the Japanese weapon of last resort, the suicide bomb. minutes after four o'clock. It hit the superstructure. Everything went black. We knew we were hit because we were aft, we were machinery aft. Machinery forward was still good. Over the next few days, the Japanese launched kamikaze assaults on the invasion fleet, which did not wholly relent in all the weeks of fighting that lay ahead. Here, a Japanese V pilot has ended his career with a direct hit on a carrier of the Essex class. He's caused casualties and damage on board an enemy ship. And it's for just that purpose that his own life was written off from the first day of his training. In this action, By the, the end of the Okinawa campaign, the suicides of 1,465 kamikaze pilots had accounted for 29 ships sunk, 120 damaged, and 3,048 sailors killed. It was a kamikaze he took us out. We found his body with a parachute. Couldn't understand why he had a parachute. Because he might have been shot down and he could bail out. 
What's the answer to that? I would tell you this, and this is hard for me to tell you. He did his job and he did it well. On the 9th of April, the American invasion force opened its main offensive. Third Amphibious Corps, General Geiger, swung north. As it happens, the northern thrust would meet the least resistance, and the north of the island would fall first. 24th Corps, General Hodge, landed alongside Geiger's corps and swung south. And here the fighting was hard against an enemy that had sworn to defend every inch to the death. Advancing in parallel along opposite coasts, Geiger's corps reached Cape Hedo at the northern tip of Okinawa in less than two weeks, though the Motobu Peninsula was not secured for another week. By this time, the, the Americans have been fighting the Japanese for three years, and they've been through some appalling battles. They know what the Japanese are capable of, but on Okinawa, it gets even worse. And it's probably the worst battle that the Americans fight in the Pacific. I mean, it was the worst ordeal you could imagine. Worse for the Japanese, because they killed themselves if they weren't killed by the Americans. But both sides are suffering huge losses. Heroic dead of a combined army and marine force mark the grim battlefield of Okinawa, where one of the bloodiest engagements of the war is being fought. Thousands of Yanks have been wounded, and other thousands have sacrificed their lives to drive a fanatical foe from this vital base, the doorstep to Japan itself. In the South, it was a different story. The Americans came up against the well-planned fortifications of the Shuri Line. and did not breach it and take the island's capital, Naha, until May 27th. Shuri Castle, key to the defensive line, fell on May 29th, with Japanese defenders now falling back for a last stand on the southern tip of the island. The fight to the last spirit of the Japanese soldier was nowhere more apparent than in the fighting for Okinawa and it's estimated that out of 108,000 Japs on the island, 101,000 had to be wiped out before victory was achieved. Most of them were blasted out, one by one. On June the 17th, Japanese morale collapsed. The Japanese started to surrender in numbers. To the surprise of the Americans, who had not known it elsewhere in the Pacific. On June 22nd, General Ushijima committed suicide. And you can see that they've finally decided that this war's no use. It takes most of the battle before that occurs, and that's a sign of just how tough it's going to be to defeat the Japanese. Casualty lists were catastrophic. Japanese casualties exceeded 110,000. America's 40,000 in battle and nearly 10,000 more to kamikaze. Okinawa's not where the Pacific War finishes because the Americans and the British and the entire Western Allies know that they've got to defeat the Japanese home islands. So one of the most important consequences of Okinawa is that it feeds into the American planning for what is proposed to be the invasion of Japan. And it tells the Americans that they'll not only kill lots and lots of Japanese troops and civilians, but they'll lose perhaps a million troops of their own. That figure weighed heavily in the debate that would resolve the next phase of the war, the use of a new weapon. So in a sense, Okinawa shapes the history of conflict in the second half of the 20th century. 